Okay, good afternoon everybody. Let me start with an apology and a confession. An apology for having the most boring CV in your little booklet. My only apology is I'm a professor of computer science. We hire people because they have long and boring CVs. Okay, also work in an engineering faculty. Um, and a confession. I wondered about doing this one. I don't like TED Talks or not most of them at least. I think most of them have a bit superficial message of if we all do good for one another, the world will be a great place. As one of my PhD students would say, that's hippie talk. And we don't do hippie talk in my group. But then I thought, hey, maybe the best way to change that is to do my own TED talk and then we'll see what, what happens. And so I'll talk a little bit about open learning and the work we do on learning analytics. And as was mentioned in the introduction, at the moment there is this crisis meeting, which is starting, I think, at the moment, uh, of the Flemish government on the reform of secondary education. And I think it's great that this is leading to a crisis for the government. Because I think education has been in a crisis for a long time already. And the best way to illustrate that, I think, is that for most five, six, seven-year-olds, learning is fun. If you ask a six-year-old, shall we learn together how to build something, that has a very positive connotation. For every 16-year-old, if you say, let's go learn something, that has a very negative connotation. We should change that, obviously. Right? And I'm trying to change that a little bit, at least in higher education, where a lot of the learning is moving online. And we see some of that in schools, but very little and way too slow. Okay? And one of the consequences of moving learning online is that it becomes more open. You know, on the internet, information wants to be free. On the internet, learning wants to be open. And this is really a movement that has gathered a lot of pace and steam uh, the last few years, last year especially, and I think maybe some of you may be familiar with this notion of MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses. It basically means that you can join my course, as can two billion other people who are connected to the internet. You don't have to register at KU Leuven. You don't have to ask anyone's permission. You just need to know the hashtag. And of course, I'm not alone doing this. This is work we do with a big international group. Uh, of people that do similar things and maybe the thing that's most widely known at the moment is the number of spin-offs that have grown out of it. One that is very popular now is, is this Coursera um, spin-off from, from Stanford. And I got a mail from them actually yesterday that said that their computer science course, CS101, just registered 300,000 students. In the same class at KU Leuven, my university, we have probably about 500 students. That means that we need to teach this class for 600 years to reach the same audience. It's a bit different, right? Now, I don't teach to 300,000 students, okay? I'm not that, you yeah. uh, We don't get that big number uh, online, but we do get 3,000 students. I do regularly teach MOOCs for 3,000, 4,000 students, zero of which pay registration at KU Leuven. In fact, I suspect that very few of them have Flemish parents who pay taxes that pay my salary. Is that a problem? I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think it's my problem in any case. Okay. And so what I do with my students and, you know, other people, again, other people do very similar things, is we just create open environments using very old-fashioned technology. I give them a wiki. The wiki is empty, and then I say, use the wiki to organize yourself. And you know what happens when you give people responsibility for their own organization? It's very funny. They start acting responsibly, because they have the responsibility, right? And so my students organize themselves in small groups, and then they do stuff online, and then we work on real serious problems, like 
um, building applications that we release in an App Store, in the Google App Store or the iTunes App Store, um, and that real people use. And they tweet about that to share their intermediate results. As I said, they work on really important problems. So a few weeks ago, one of them released an app that helps you to find the best friture, the best place to, bell, to buy Belgian fries, not French fries, uh, in Leuven. You see, like really important problems uh, that are really motivating for the students. So next time you come to Leuven, download Friet Leuven. If you want to, you can go to YouTube now and have, uh, watch a video that, that explains how it works. And so it's working on authentic problems in an open environment where we replace fake learning, where students work on silly problems and hand in an assignment that maybe a teacher reads or maybe he doesn't, and we replace that by open communication on the web. Everything my students do, everything I can see, you can see too. And in fact, we regularly get a lot of, well, not a lot, but we regularly get people from the outside to comment on what the students do. And it changes everything about the dynamic in the classroom, because now they work with real people, not with me, people like you, well, real people, okay, who will use an application like Sweet Learn. I've also stopped doing exams in those courses. I think if I have one suggestion for policymakers, it would be just forbid exams. It will make people think about what they are trying to do in class. Exams should be, I think, originally were intended to be a means to just double check. Have you all, if you are my class, have you all roughly learned what we were supposed to learn in this course? Because then we can move on. So let's do a little exam and, you know, find out. That's a means, it's not a goal. Now for both my colleagues and many of my students, it's become the goal to pass the exam. That's ridiculous. And then you get questions like, is this part of what we need to know for the exam? And I always say, that's not a question I can answer. The real question is, is this interesting? Should I know this because I should know this, not because I need to pass an exam? So we've replaced the exams, and last semester we experimented quite a lot with a system that other people use as well. It's an open batch system. Uh, the Mozilla Foundation is behind this initiative. And basically, as you take part in my class, and as you demonstrate that you acquire certain skills or a certain amount of knowledge, you acquire little badges that you can put in a virtual backpack. And at the end of the course, I just look at your backpack and go, wow, you've got a lot of badges, like in scouting, right? So, you know, you get a high grade. You have no badges at all. Actually, the intent is that everybody gets a lot of badges. People don't regularly fail my courses that I teach that way. They do work very hard. The other thing we do as people work in these classes is we try to capture their digital exhaust. What that means is every time they click on something, every time they send a message, every time they post a blog post, every time they comment on another one's blog post, every time they write code, I've got engineering students, right, so they write software code, uh, we capture that. Every time they release, when they release the app, every time it's downloaded, when people evaluate it, we capture all of that, and we get a lot of data about the students. It's not really big, big data. It's more like small data because the numbers are not that big. But it's still a very detailed picture of what students do. And you can look at it like in this way, which allows me to figure out how students are doing and who should get help for what, where every line is a student and every column is something we measure, and this is but a small subset. And the idea is, referring again to quantified self as in the introduction, the idea is to capture a lot of the relevant activities of the students. And we want to push this really, really, really far. At the moment, we're doing a lot of you know, the stuff they do digitally, but we're thinking about wiring the students up, giving them sensors and measuring stuff they do. And for those of you who work in higher education and may be familiar with things like a learning management system or a virtual learning environment, you may think, oh yeah, he's capturing everything they do in Leuven, in Blackboard, or in Moodle, or in one of those systems. But as one of my colleagues, Abelardo Pardo, from whom I stole this slide, uh, would say, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Very little of the relevant activities of the student go on in the learning management system. It's like very little learning goes on in the classroom. And if you want to get a real picture of what is really happening in their heads, you should go beyond 
what is in the learning management system. Now, we're not the only ones doing that. Um, some people do that as well, and they uh, use the data to steer the students. This is a screen capture from a Coursera course. And I think that's kind of an interesting thing to do, but I think it's also a very dangerous thing to do. I think it's kind of interesting because it really works well. In a Coursera course where you may have, as I just said, 300,000 students, or even only 30,000 students, the law of numbers starts to play. That means that whatever you do as a student, we have very similar students to compare you to. And we can do the recommendation trick. We can do what is called educational data mining and figure out you are a little bit like him and she, uh, she was. And when she did this, uh, that didn't work so well. But when he did that, that worked very well. So we'll tell you to do the same thing. And we can actually build systems now. This is you know, my area of research. We can build systems that will automatically guide you as a student and that will tell you every 10 or 15 minutes what you should do. And these systems work, if you have large numbers of students, very well. My claim is they're better than the average teacher. Not as good, they're better. But they're also dangerous, in my view. Because if you teach students that way, Students will graduate, and I think we can make them graduate in three years rather than five years as we do now for a master's degree, and I think I can reach the same level with that number of students. But the problem is those students will get out of the university and be used to a piece of software that tells them every 15 minutes, you should do this. And this, by the way, the software is doing that in a very good way, but it isn't giving students these things that we typically talk about as 21st century skills. It isn't telling them how to be creative, communicative, collaborative, the C skills, right? So we don't do any of that data mining in my group and the people that we work with. We try to do a slightly different thing. It's almost the same, but it's a little bit different. We gather the data and we don't try to process them in a way that the software can make the decisions for you. Rather, we try to build dashboards that help you, as a student, to make the decision yourself. And we do that using participatory design approaches. So this is a dashboard actually that the students designed for their own benefit, using the data about their own interactions. It all gets very reflective. Recursion is something that we really like in computer science, right? And so the students develop the, their own applications that support their learning efforts. And it's very much like the dashboard in the car. The idea is very much that it's a little bit subtle. The idea, like in this case, it's a mobile app. From time to time, you look at it. And at the bottom part, it tells you how good you are doing as a student. If the arrow is straight up, you're in the middle of the pack. If it's there, you're way ahead of everybody else. If this student here is lagging behind a little bit. And then it tells you also how to act on the data. Because we use a lot of social media in my course. Um, you have pointers there to things the students can do. Now compare that with what the students see in their official learning management system. This is what most of the students see most of the time at KU Leuven. Does this tell the student what to do? What the options are? No. It tells them, here's a list of courses. That's why I think learning management systems must die. In fact, I think they're already dead. We're just not acknowledging them. And I say that, by the way, as someone who introduced these systems at KU Leuven about 12, 10 or 12 years ago. Now, there's other approaches that colleagues use that I think are also very interesting. A much more visual approach is something they use in uh, Wollongong in uh, Australia, um, where they sort of represent the communication between the students. And you can use that to figure out which students need better support to be more collaborative with other students. Or here's another example that I've used in my class to just show that you not only can do this for very quantitative stuff, you can also do this for more emotional stuff. So in this case, we did sentiment analysis on top of the messages in the class. And you see how, roughly speaking, the, the mood in the class goes from red, which is very much associated with insecurity, a feeling of, I can never do this, to green, a feeling of mastery. Yes, we did it. We built this app. Yes, we released it. People are using it. So for me, this is a pretty, you know, 
pretty good picture for my class, although I do understand that the students are a little bit disoriented and worried in the beginning. We don't only do this in digital environments, this is something colleagues in Lausanne, in the Polytechnic, are doing, integrating some of this learning analytics in the physical um, environment. In this case, it's a very simple idea, the, the LEDs that you see in front of every person, uh, think of this as four students working together on an assignment, the more you talk, the more LEDs light up. And so it gives you rather, maybe not so very subtle, but rather clear feedback about how much you are talking. And in fact, there's been some studies, someone did a PhD on this, there's some studies that this helps you to regulate your behavior. If you've been talking all the time and your classmates have never had a chance to say anything, all your LEDs light up and you will have a tendency to, you know, slow down a bit. Okay. Obviously, I think this whole notion of quantified self-related approaches to learning analytics is only just starting as we have this wave of wearable computing that's coming towards us with Google Glass and watches and all sorts of sensors uh, connected to your body. As we start, by the way, also experimenting with putting helmets on your head that measure your brain activity, both the number of inputs that we can gather, as well as the way that we can feed that back to you to help you navigate your learning is just beginning to, to explode. Okay, and so I hope we can report on some more stuff a little bit later. In the meantime, if you're interested in this sort of thing, we've, had, we've set up this uh, Society for Learning Analytics Research, SOLAR. Uh, we do regular events. In fact, I organized the last conference. We had about 250 people who work in this area uh, in Leuven about a month ago. And if you're interested, I very much encourage you to get in touch with me or to join SOLAR. Thank you very much.